Engineering Podcast. We like to uh, just start off by introducing our panel. We're here again with uh, Maddie, aka Mutz. Hey, Maddie. Hey. And uh, Jim Elwood. What's up, Jim? Hello. And Dave's back with us too with a relic. How you doing, Dave? Howdy. And myself, Chris, or Logan. So uh, first of all, let's just start off by thanking everyone for the great feedback last month. We had so many people uh, write in, stop in the IRC channel. Uh, send us little Twitter messages telling us thanks for the podcast. So we really appreciate the positive feedback. We hope we keep living up to your expectations here with that. Um, we had a lot, didn't we? We had a, I think, Dave, you, you, you hooked us up with a guy from Security Justice, your buddy over there. Yeah, absolutely. They, they definitely gave you ranting uh, reviews and raves um, yesterday on the, on the podcast that I was on. They did, and they, they linked their site linked to our yep. podcast, which really – we got a lot of hits from them. Well, one of, of the, one of my buddies that I know too um, actually has uh, on his top URL bar his favorite bookmarks is uh, socialengineer.org. So <laughs> hey, definitely making cool. some impact. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Well, it's nice to to get some feedback from other people who've been doing this for a lot longer than us, and to hear what they have to say. So uh, you know, shout out to the security justice guys. We appreciate that. Uh, as far as anything new on the site, you know, a lot happened. I mean, a lot has happened since the last podcast. But uh, maybe what's most noteworthy is um, we added a couple new sections to the to the website. We have a newsletter section where we're going to be archiving all of our old newsletters. So if you missed last month, you can go there and and get hooked up with the uh, last month's newsletter. And, that that um, newsletter was really good. I I really liked that article that Jim wrote. It, it really really was nice. We got so much feedback on that. Yeah. I couldn't believe how many people wrote in. And we're we're like flipping out about just the simplicity of it, but they never really thought of their kids as being social engineers. Yeah, but it's so true. It's it so is. True. It is. It fits perfect. It's kind of scary, though. <laughs> it is. You just watch how pure they are a lot of yeah. times, and, and just how honest it comes across. And you know, they they're they're little devils. Yeah, we were just talking to a guy in the channel the other day, who said he read that, and then he he sat back and he went, "Holy crap, my my granddaughter." Without knowing what she was doing, SE'd me into taking her to Disney World. <laughs> and, and by the time he was done agreeing to everything, he was single-handedly paying for his whole family, which I guess is a, which I guess is a huge family, and it cost him like, like 25 k <laughs> to take well, I know, I know where, where I'm blocking my kids uh, from going to, socialengineer.org. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got filters on your kid's computer. <laughs> no SE.org, you're done. <laughs> Yeah, so that was kind of cool. I thought that was a really great, really great article, and we got a lot of um, positive feedback too on the on the set tool. That I article. did, I, I did hear um, quite a few people complaining a little bit about the podcast, though. Complaining. Yeah, they they said that uh, at the end of the the podcast, we didn't talk about how to get free checks. <laughs> it's okay. That was just a ploy for them. To the whole, see, we, so they all got social engineered. Huh? Yeah, we social right. engineered them exactly. See, so we'll be talking about that at the end of this one. one. Yeah, we'll be talking about how to get free chicks at the end of this podcast, so make sure you listen throughout the whole thing. But we might even do it halfway through, so you have to listen to the whole thing and can't skip to the end. <laughs> Every podcast will promise something. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to uh, sign up for the newsletter or check the archives there, too. So the only other thing we added uh, to the site was a podcast section, too, um, which we did promise, but we have a nice notes page for each podcast, which we have links to the URLs or videos that we discuss or other things that will be on, on there. So you can check that out, too, on the on the se.org. We've also been working out on the uh, framework, kind of um, repairing some of the, the links, some of the things that are old or improving, augmenting some of the other the other things there, too. So keep checking back on the framework for, for new items or improved items. And uh, after we announced last month about getting contributors, we had a ton of people write in. Uh, offering to contribute either writing or other other kinds of help. 
So we really appreciate that. The community supports, uh, it's still just as good. So we appreciate that. Great. And I definitely have to give uh, kudos to uh, Elwood. He, uh, he contacted me with a lot of improvements and enhancements that I can make onto um, the social engineering toolkit. So I actually committed those changes and added a bunch of different types of things for it. And, and actually, it's uh, version 0.2 alpha now. Awesome. Well, we, we love you for it. Dude, it. Seriously, when I was using that, that, that set, uh, real real world pen test and I was comparing I was using core to send messages and I was doing it with set and I was having a much higher success rate with set it was a lot easier to use uh, I, I really just pushed core to the side on that one and, and core is a great tool you know not, not, not insulting it at all it, but for what my needs were at the time it was it was stellar that's 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 a huge compliment I definitely appreciate it man we got a ton of positive feedback too a lot of emails came in people uh, kind of with the holy crap factor, you know, <laughs> and like I can't believe this tool's out there. This is amazing, you know. I can't believe no one thought of this before. So a lot of a lot of good credit to you, Dave, for uh, for developing that. We look forward to that thing we talked about last month with the websites, uh, the W getting the websites and being able to create that. So. Yep, that should be coming out shortly. I have uh, working proof of concept code. I just have to incorporate it now. And I uh, yeah. definitely want to thank everybody else that's contributed to it. I mean, it's been a, a big community thing. I'm looking forward for the Metasploit integration. Nudge, nudge, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another thing that you might notice is new on the site is uh, on the sponsors page. We have a new sponsor this month. Uh, it's a company called Spy Associates. They're a pretty cool company. They, um, if you visit their site, it's a spyassociates.com. They sell just what it sounds like, kind of gadgets, covert gadgets, and uh, and things for or social engineers, or law enforcement. I guess that's their main customer base is law enforcement uh, people that that need to um, use different kind of accessories, I guess, in their in their jobs. It's not, so the, we were, cheesy, it's not the cheesy Sky Mile Sky Miles type type gadgets. It's it's the it's the really nice ones as well. Right? Yeah. It's not it's not like a Toys R Us, um, you know, spy kit. You know, <laughs> this is the real deal. This is things like their main their main customers are uh, government. And I really like that law enforcement. Yeah, it's a beautiful site, and and uh, if you go down the sidebar there on the left of the site, they have everything from you know like high end night vision, which I know Elwood's been begging to uh, test that. <laughs> For some reason, Elwood wants night vision goggles. <laughs> Don't I, ask I me why. I think that's every boy's little dream too. I mean, I have the same thing. I, w I want high end night vision goggles too. When I had them, when, I, when I was in Iraq, I had them, and I love those things. I used to wear them in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened to you, man. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing night visual, night goggles, night goggle vision. Night you good visuals. Yeah, I say I, that five times fast. I carry, I carried that everywhere I went, man. And then I had to give them up. I was like really bummed out. I was hoping they forget about it. Well, we'll see if we can get a pair and let you guys play with them. <laughs> Sounds good to me. X-ray specs too. We need some X-ray specs. X-ray specs. Yeah, I don't see those on the site. Those are more like those oh. goofy spy tools, you know. Yeah. That, that's no, the I Toys R Us. That's the Toys R Us uh, brand. Yeah, okay. I tell you, they have some stuff there though that is ridiculous. Like they have cameras hidden in almost any kind of device you can imagine, uh, as small as a button, the head of a, a screw. Um, they have ones hidden inside of um, like like diaper boxes and stuff. I just crazy. Ooh. I know, I know, it's just whacked out stuff. You got to check out the That's site. One place right? you won't check for. <laughs> right. I mean, who's going to go into that? You know. For well, just cameras. just to be honest with you, I mean, I check I check my diaper bin every day just to make sure. For a camera? Who can? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's your diaper bin, not even your son's. <laughs> not even mine. I do have one in the office. <laughs> so this month, um, our buddy at Spy Associates, he sent us this really neat device. It's a Spyhawk Super Track GPS logger. It's a, it's a neat device. It's tiny. It's like um, maybe the, the size of three gum sticks. Really lightweight. Um, it runs off of a couple AAA batteries. And it has these powerful magnets in the back, and it has some neat technology. It runs off of um, um, like vibrations. So as soon as it feels the item you attach it to moving, it starts. It turns itself on and starts logging GPS data. So we did a couple tests with this. Um, the magnets are pretty powerful, so you can attach it to really any kind of metal. And the documentation that comes with it gives you all sorts of whacked out ideas where you can hide it, like in the grills or the headlights. Um, and it doesn't really need clear line of sight. For GPS, so our first test, I, I put it in the under the hood uh, of a car, and just shut the hood and let it sit there and thought, well, this probably won't work because the hood was metal, metal might block it. But sure enough, man, this thing logged 
logged everything. And it, it, it's what's really great about the interface, we're going to be writing about this in the newsletter and then have a spot on the site for these reviews too, is it tells you the, um, the, the time, the day, it tells you the speed the person was driving, how long they stop. So, you know, if they stop at a traffic light, it'll tell you they're one minute, or if they stop at the local coffee shop, you know, car stop for 15 minutes. And, and this is the coolest part. You can click a button, and it will tie it into Google Maps, and you can see the location of that exact spot. Or wow, that's you, amazing. It is amazing. Or you can export their whole route into Google Earth. And, and then you can you import that into Google Earth, and it will show you like a, a red line through the whole map, where they went, where they stopped. You can zoom in, get, get pictures of the locations uh, of where they were. Uh, you know, in cities like where Google is doing the street view, you can actually zoom right in to where you can look at the location where they stop. It's just amazing, really. Uh, Very useful. Yeah, I thought so too. I mean, I was talking to our, our buddy from last month, our law enforcement guy, uh, Matt, and he was saying they would use these type of devices all the time when they were tracking uh, drug dealers or, or other kinds of people. They wanted to just find out their location, maybe hold a case against them. They would attach something like this, but they would use a more crude method, like a altered cell phone. Yeah. They, yeah. And they, they would throw it in the trunk or shove it somewhere and then be able to, to get that later on and track data from where they were and where they went and use that in a case against them. This, this thing is just so much more... It's just so much better looking and really easy to use. That sounds pretty sweet. Yeah, I'll be um, I'll be linking that. I'll be linking that. I think to the uh, get some pictures of that, Chris. Yeah, I do. I have some pictures, and I'll be linking. I'll be linking to it, and I'm going to take pictures of actually. Uh, we have some pictures already to go for the. For what is the your, site. What does your wife think about that? <laughs> well, I think here's the thing. I hate to say is she was our first test subject. <laughs> 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 and uh, I didn't tell her before I did it. I thought oh, she's not going to mind, you know. And Uh-oh. then she, she came home, and I said, um, "So hey, I put a tracker on your car. I'm going to go grab it real quick." And, and she's like, "What do you mean you put a tracker on my car?" <laughs> and I'm like, oh, "It's just a little thing I got from from uh, you know Spy Associates." And he's, she's like, "You tracked where I went." She's like, well, "What's wrong with you?" And I'm like, "Well, what's, what's wrong with you? Like, it doesn't really matter, does it?" And she's like. What's wrong with you? And I'm like, <laughs> well, anyhow, she doesn't end up going to the grocery store, so it was no big deal. But I guess I should have told her first, you know. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't sleep on the couch for that one. Although yeah, your wife is very understanding. She kind of kind of has to be. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so we'll have more on that, I think, in the newsletter, and then we'll have some pictures. I'm going to um, take some some pictures actually of when it's hidden. You can't you can barely see the thing. It's completely black with gray. Uh, the, gray, the magnets have a gray cover, so it really blends in a lot, with, uh, especially if it's underneath the car in a bumper or something. It's very, very non-noticeable. What's today about? Today, yeah, pa- pretexting. We, we decided that uh, this month a lot of the people wrote in that it would, be, it would be good to discuss pretexting as part of our real theme for this month, how it fits into social engineering. We thought about how pretesting fits into other avenues of life that's not social engineering. Uh, I think it was Elwood and I were sitting around discussing where where pretesting where pretexting could be used in other aspects of life or other jobs. What is and pretexting though? I mean, it took me a while to figure out what exactly you mean when you said pretexting. What what, what is it? Well, we we define it, and Dave, you back me up on this. Thing. We define pretexting in the social engineering sense as you creating a, a scenario or creating a, a storyline um, that will be used to persuade, and, and the social engineering is by a target. Now, uh, we'll we'll broaden that out maybe for the terms of using it in like a radio host uh, type of scenario, but in social engineering. We create this scenario, we, cre- we create this, and it's more than just creating a lie. You know, it's not a matter of saying, oh, I yeah. came up with this lie of, of something I did and then having it be so believable. It, it's really much deeper than that. A, a solid pretext would involve a lot of data, a lot of information yeah. um, about that person that you're supposed to be. And then, and then when you portray that, it's everything from how you walk, how you talk, the knowledge you have, the things that, that you would understand that person to understand. All of yeah, that I mean, both straight. To put it to put it simply, I mean, it, it might sound cheesy, but you become that person. You are that person in every way. That's not cheesy. It's not cheesy. As a matter of fact, we were talking about that um, with a couple guys, and, it, and they said it's yeah, it's more than just believing in the lie, because that's anyone can you can anyone can convince themselves of a lie. 
but it, it, it's more than that. It's it, it, you don't want to. It's not even a lie. It's you become that character for this job. So would that include like props and, and clothes and badges and official looking sort of sort of stuff as well? Yeah, heck yeah. I mean, if you know, if your pretext is going to be, uh, let's say, a, a computer tech support person, uh, you know, for for a social engineering audit, then then yeah, you have to go into the place looking like a support person would look. You have to have the tools. You have to have the the bag, the case. You have to have the knowledge. You the knowledge, you the knowledge yeah. for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a big go. one. That's a big one. If you walk in, you don't even know what a server is. You don't know what a USB port is, and you're supposed to be the tech support guy. You know, epic fail. So yeah, pretexting, you know, with that knowledge, pretexting means you have to, a lot of preparation. There's a lot of preparation, a lot of research done ahead of time for for a proper pretext. I mean, even using the scenario as, you know, an IT help desk or, um, you know, IT person, I mean, you have to have point of context you're going to go to, how they're going to be expecting you. I mean, do you do a call ahead of time to, to make sure that they expect you? I mean, there's a lot that that goes involved in planning and making sure that you execute properly. I mean, one one little flaw will actually get you get you busted and won't work properly. Yeah, I agree with that. I think one of the main aspects of pretexting is building trust. And people, you know, we, we do so many things in, like, alpha mode, you know, where we don't even think. And that if we do something different than what they expect, we'll raise that red flag, and that will ruin the trust factor, and we can wreck yep. our whole our whole pretext. So we have to go into the the whole the whole deal, doing things the way that they would expect this person in their life to do it. Yeah, exactly, that fits. That, that's exactly what I was thinking, Dave. And when 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 uh, Jim and I were talking about what other things besides social engineers, what other kind of people besides social engineers use pretexting. We talked about radio or TV personalities, people that that have to put on an air or put on a, a front face to to be able to be with the public so much and not really release everything about them, right, Jim? Right, right. The 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 whole idea of of taking these people that use in in in, in this instance uh, radio use pretexting as part of their day to day life and and learning from that. Uh, you know, this is how they get their income. They they rely on it. It's not just something that they do on a one-off basis. It's something they do, you know, in, in, in uh, our guest uh, case, five days a week, so for years. Yeah. And and I think when we started discussing it, because Jim and I were trying to think, man, who you know, who would be a great person to have on the program to interview that really isn't a social engineer? Because I think really we can learn a lot about how to be a better social engineer by talking to people that do these things and aren't even in the security industry, right? And, and, and Elwood, I think you're the one. You, you knew a lot about, about Mishki, didn't you, from your previous yeah, Well, I've listened to him for, for a long time. I, I never lived in the area that, that he broadcast out of, but, uh, you know, I, I came across him one night. I was, for whatever reason, I was up driving in Minnesota late at night and, uh, I came across this broadcast that it, I stopped because it was it was just really unique. It sounded like there was just some guy playing around in a shack that uh, you know, and he was just talking to his friends with an AM broadcaster that was that was there, and he was he was having fun, you know. And I I, I left it there just because it, it was unique. And then you know, the more I listened, the more I started putting together. This is an actual a professional show. And it's not that it didn't sound professional; it just sounded very casual and very fun and very uh, just very very comfortable. So our guest that we're going to have in today is Tom Mischke. Tom is a is a pretty famous radio personality. Um, Jim, where's Tom again from? Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota. I saw that on the Wikipedia page that we'll link to. And and he has a pretty popular radio show out there. Actually, if you if you type in Tom Mischke into Google, you'll find a couple fan pages with some really hilarious um, radio clips, as well as you can find find his radio show on City Pages, which we'll put a link up to that too. So uh, I think Tom Tom, you're here with us now, right? Yes. Okay. Tom, uh, just wanted to thank you for stopping in and being with us on the show here today. I appreciate your time. Sure. Maybe you can give us a little input of how you how you got into radio. Like, what's your history of getting into the radio program? I got into radio by uh, first being a caller. 
I was initially one of those guys who calls fairly regularly and is on talk radio programs. Uh, I was a, a journalism student and planning on pursuing uh, newspaper reporting as a career. And when I learned, first of all, there was such a thing as talk radio, and second of all, that you could, as a private citizen, participate in it, I found it intriguing, uh, the idea of without being trained, without being uh, schooled, without uh, being invited in, you could simply uh, you know, dial seven digits and find yourself on a 50,000-watt radio program as a player. I just thought that was odd, uh, certainly with your... 5.30 nightly news, you didn't all of a sudden see Dan Rather uh, say, well, we'll take a call now from Kansas City. I just thought it was very strange that randomly throughout a program that was a professional broadcast, average people could participate uh, with very little screening. So I, I wanted to test just how true that was and how common it was to be able to just get on, and I found it was extraordinarily easy what I didn't know was what to say once I got on, because the truth of the matter was I didn't really want to discuss seriously any political topics or any other issues. I just wanted to uh, be on, be on the air, join the fray, be with the other guys who were the professionals. So since I needed to have some shtick, I ended up creating uh, different characters who would call up. Uh, I would never identify myself, and I would hang up always before they had a chance to respond to whatever it was I said, and I got labeled after that the phantom caller, the guy who just appeared when you didn't know he was coming and disappeared before you could talk to him. How many times did you do that and before you got that label? I, it wasn't very long. I'd say I was calling every day for once a day for about three weeks before they gave me that label, and I continued to call for the next two years, <laughs> uh, at least four, sometimes five times a week. And uh, it just became expected. They counted on it. They They lamented uh, its absence when I didn't call. And so I, I just saw it as a part-time job I had during the day. I would just pull up back then, and we didn't have cell phones. i just pull up to pay phones and uh, make the call and then go on with my day. So and so I enjoyed it because... Social, sorry, you basically social engineered your way into your job. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I'd hang up the phone after making my call and... I'd drive away and I'd turn on the radio, I'd hear the last seven seconds of my call, I'd hear myself hanging up and I'd hear their reaction and they'd talk about the call for the next minute and a half. And I'd, I, I enjoyed that the way other guys enjoy uh, stamp collecting. It just became a hobby. <laughs> wow. How did that turn into an actual career in radio? The change came when uh, the guy who I was calling most of the time, it was usually one, the same show. It was a show called the Don Vogel Show at AM 1500 KSTP, where I would eventually work. He wanted a sidekick at one point down the line and invited me to a tryout, asked me to show up and sit next to him and see how it went. And he enjoyed it so much, uh, he asked management to allow me to come on board as a permanent part of the show uh, management was reluctant, uh, and Don Vogel said to me, how little are you willing to work for? And I was in my 20s then and certainly not making any kind of money and enjoying the idea that I could even get anything for this. Well, I ended up getting $20 a show. That's all they paid when I started. I was a sidekick in a major market, afternoon drive with a guy, and I got $20 a show and thought I was uh, thought I was living pretty well. After that, I ended up uh, two years in deciding what I really wanted to do was my own show and not be a sidekick. So two years later, I made a proposal to the general manager and was given a nighttime show, and that's when I started on my own. So previous, you were you mentioned that you would come up with these characters that you would call in briefly. This is when you were before you were even hired. Um, how much time did you spend like thinking about the character or what you were going to portray when you called in to the, to the radio? An enormous and embarrassingly large amount of time. Uh, embarrassing in that here was something I wasn't getting paid for and was considered by a lot of people who knew me a silly little thing to be spending time with. And I would sometimes spend two hours crafting a call, writing it out. <laughs> no, actually, that's a really interesting topic because, you know, on the topic of pretexting, which in a, in a security standpoint, um, pre pretexting is coming up with a storyline, a baseline that you're going to try to make the person be convinced that you are. So if we're going to audit the company for their security and I'm going to be their tech support guy, when I go into that company, 
acting as a tech support guy. I need to look, sound, talk, walk, have the knowledge of that tech support guy. So, you know, if I'm not really computer savvy or if I'm if I'm not a tech support guy ever in the past, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time preparing that pretext, you know, in order to go in there and sound and walk and be the part that I'm going that I'm going to play when I'm at that company. So yeah, hearing, I, hearing I you say that for a radio show, that's pretty interesting. You know, a couple hours uh, it seems like you were able to quickly adapt to a to a personality you were about to portray. Found I'll give you an that? example. Pe- pe- people sometimes think about um, moments in in broadcasting that sound spontaneous, and they may take for an example David Letterman walking up into the audience on his show and talking to members of the audience, and they say, "Well, there's clearly a moment of spontaneity because you can't possibly predict what the people there are going to say." Truth of the matter is. Prior to going up into the uh, audience, David Letterman with his staff goes over all the possible scenarios that could possibly occur when you ask someone where they're from, why they're in New York City, what they've been doing since they got here. They go over all the possible answers, all the possible comebacks, all the best comebacks. By the time he ventures into the audience, it is almost impossible for there to be a spontaneous moment. Someone else might say, well, how about the guests who come on? You never know what they're going to say. A good friend of mine, Mike Veck, uh, was on the Conan O'Brien show. He's interviewed three times in the green room prior to going on that show. Whatever answers he gives that are particularly entertaining answers become then the questions they give Conan O'Brien to ask. By the time he's giving his answer on Conan O'Brien's show, it's the fourth time he's been asked and given that answer. Spontaneity is very difficult to find because people really want to craft the moment a certain way. That's unbelievable. That, that, that's really unbelievable. I'm astounded. Yeah. How many times I've watched the show, uh, seen, seen things like that, and go, man, that, was, that must have been completely spontaneous. <laughs> been duped. I've been social they're, engineered. They're terrified to rely. They're terrified to rely on spontaneity because the, the the terror rests in the possibility of it going horribly wrong, being horribly dull, being unfunny. Uh, they really want to avoid that, and so they make sure. This is, by the way, in both cases here. These are shows that are edited afterwards. In my particular case, I never even had the luxury of editing. It was live. They're not live. They're pre-recorded, and they still work that hard. So it just goes to show you how how much what appears spontaneous in life often is not. Yeah, can you give me like an example of um, of a scenario that you would use, like back before you were actually a radio host, when you would prepare this pretext, for lack of better terms, and then call in? Can you give us an example of like one that that was popular? Well, I would I would actually sing songs sometimes. And and I would I would write songs that were parodies based on what the topic was at, on that particular day, or I would be an old man, a uh, rather deranged and 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 off kilter fellow who who would be, you know, they'd be too polite to want to hang up on him, but at the same time he was saying things that were so crazy, that they they were they were trying to muffle laughter, and. I'm sitting there leaning over a piece of paper, a legal pad, with all sorts of words scratched out and all sorts of sentences uh, deleted and new ones added, and, and I'm really going through a script while in their mind, this wonderful theater of the mind that's in radio, they're imagining some old guy you know, with his uh, 1910 candlestick phone seated, seated by the fireplace making a call. I'm at a desk, you know, in an office, really making sure that I do this exactly the way I want to do it, having practiced it a few times. Um, I can't remember, you know, specific bits because they don't, they don't, uh, they're from so long ago. We have to go back to the 80s for this. But, but that was that was how. I, and then I would listen afterwards to uh, judge how they were by the reaction, and the reaction would often determine what I'd do next time, whether it worked or didn't work, whether what, whether the reaction was what I wanted or not. So you would actually sit at home and practice like an old man's voice and kind of. Mm-hmm. inflections he would have or the things that he would say in order to come yeah, off Yeah, going over it, <laughs> trying to sound believable and trying to sound uh, conversational. Um, no one, I guarantee you, no one has ever known without me telling them in all the years I've been in radio how much of what I'm doing I'm reading. So I guess, I guess the $1 million question for me is how do you, how do you act the part convincingly 
uh, in real time? How do you, like, is there a trick? Is there, is there something that you need to do apart from preparation um, where you manage to sound convincing as if this really is happening in real time and isn't premeditated? Uh, the, the the number one thing I have to do to make that work is I have to actually believe for those 30 seconds to three minutes, however long I'm on, I have to actually believe that I am that person. Mm -hmm. And thus, any kind of uh, inflection, reaction statement, any kind of um, shift from the from the page, all has to be in keeping with what this particular person would really do. It's really just that 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 method acting approach where it isn't any more that I'm pretending to be somebody for the time that I'm doing this I am that person or what I assume a person like that would be and then only when the call ends do I sort of snap out of it and realize okay this was all just fun and games but it really is for that stretch uh, a matter of convincing myself that I'm not pretending to be somebody I'm, I'm almost channeling another human being uh, which I assume a lot of people in theater must uh, understand quite well. Do you use do you use uh, people from your own life or people that you know to base your characters on? I mean, always, always, all the people that I your grand, was, your were per personalities, like real personalities that I ran into, either amalgamations of one or two or three people, or actually pretending to be a human being I actually knew in my in my circles. Yeah, I I always stayed with what I knew. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question, Matty, because one of the I guess the, the deeper principles of of pretexting from a social engineering aspect is um, trying to develop a pretext of an industry or a type of person that you've never been or know nothing about it makes the job almost impossible. You, you know, like if, yeah. like you know, to just to kind of use an absurd example. There's no way on earth I'm ever going to pretext being a 19-year-old British girl. <laughs> it's just never going to happen. You know, I've never, I don't have right. any experience with that. So it's it's impossible. Whereas, um, can I can I do a pretext of uh, of someone who's been in sales or someone who's been in the security industry or a tech person? Sure, that'd be a lot easier. Uh, so it's interesting too because here you're talking about uh, Tom developing a a pretext for something that you haven't been yet, like an old an old man. But you have experience right. because either you have those kind of people in your life or you can go and interview those people, study them, know what kind of speech patterns they have and things like that. Right. And at a certain point, you are calling on some part of yourself that that relates to that type of personality some way. So even though I had not been an old man, there had to be some part of me that empathized or that 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 felt he connected to what being an old man would be, uh, it, it can't be completely foreign to your personality. It, you are tapping into another part of your personality, and maybe a part that only gets seen for that stretch of time. Uh, but I think to really pull off anything, you have to see some of yourself in some of these other people to bring those other people into yourself. So, so now that you're, you know, let's jump ahead now a decade or so, and you have your own radio show, and now you're not just doing the, the calls in, is, it, is the preparation, is it the same? Like what kind of uh, nowadays, like, you know, you're not pretexting a, maybe a particular type of person, or are you? When you're on the radio, is it really Tom Misty oh. or is it somebody else? Yeah, it's an, <clears throat> it's an aspect of myself. I always believe, and, and it's hard to say with certainty because I've only been – me, I haven't been anybody else, but I always believe that there are a lot of different people in everybody. That you know, there is no one kind of human being in a person. We all have, you know, different facets to our personality, different um, different sort of uh, masks that we that we put on. A different one, perhaps, when we're home with our family than when we're out with strangers at some business gathering. Uh, so it is an aspect of myself. Uh, can I say that what you hear is is all me? No. You know, it's someone once said who was in this business that he's a bore the other 22 hours of the day, and I understand what he meant by that. He he went to a place where you have to be on, and when you didn't have to be on anymore, he, he turned the switches off. So how do you deal with that, you know, like having to um, be 
Tom Mischke, but at the same time, when you're on the radio, having to be a person that other people expect you to be. Well, because that is, that that person is also me. So I guess the analogy I'd use is when a guy's racing down the sidelines in a football game and scoring a touchdown and throwing the football into the stands and jumping on all his teammates and screaming like crazy, and then Sunday is, or um, say uh, another day is at church. You know, boy, he doesn't seem to be the same guy. Well, he is the same guy. Those are just two parts of who he is. Hmm. Um, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that yeah, that's a good, that's if a good I were analogy. to be this guy I am on the, if I were to be the guy I am on the radio the entire time, it would be exhausting. Yeah. It would just, it would be like running the 100 yard dash constantly. So it's just, uh, it, it is me, but it's a playful side of me. It's a, it's a, it's sort of a, a letting a, a little kid out to play sometimes. Uh, so it's not phony. If it were phony, it would be hard. But it's 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 also not the complete picture. Yeah. How do you how do you filter out, um, especially being a, um, a public persona? How do you filter out um, parts that you want to expose and parts that you don't want to expose to your audiences? Well, I, I have been a big believer, and this is. Uh, a philosophy in radio that is relatively new. It didn't exist in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. It came along much later. Uh, it's a philosophy that um, you you don't try and hide parts of yourself. On the contrary, you you allow parts of yourself you might not expose to your own friends or family members. You allow those to be exposed to absolute strangers. Uh, um, as in the listening audience, the the intimacy of the medium uh, lends itself to revelations that uh, you would normally never allow out at your average dinner party. So I, I watched that happen with the guy I worked with when I worked with Don Vogel as his sidekick. I would hear him say things to an imagined audience. He couldn't see or count or, or know where they were or in what way they were listening say things to them he wouldn't say to his own wife you're in a little room you're alone you're you're you almost feel at times you're talking to yourself and there's a tendency in that situation to really open up and uh so it's not me sitting around saying oh should i let him know this should i let him know that it's the opposite it's afterwards saying boy what did i say this time you know well oh, i really want i really went on a limb today so, so how do you prevent that that from happening? So how do you stop yourself from doing that? I don't. That's my point. That's what I'm what I'm saying here is I do not prevent it. No filter. People who listen to my show, any to any allow my show, end up knowing knowing me better than um, than my own friends. So what what's I mean, the result of that? I mean, you know, if you yeah. now you do that, how do how does the how does the public react to you having all this knowledge absolute, about you? Absolute one hundred percent loyalty. They'd mm-hmm. fall on a grenade for you. They'd give you their kidney if you needed it. They just, they just, the connection you end up having for them is is unbreakable. I just had a thought. That would be a great social engineering test, huh? Have Tom ask his audience who would want to donate a kidney. See how many kidneys he gets. Oh, that's not. I have been out. <laughs> I have sorry? been out of work for. I've been out of work for long stretches of time and have had people contact the station offering organs. I'm not joking. <laughs> Well, Actually, uh, the boss has called me at home saying people are, you know, if you need a, a kidney transplant, a liver transplant, whatever, you know, they're, they they want to help. Uh, and so it's just a very intense uh, loyalty that is um, one of the reasons talk radio works so well with advertisers is because the the, the loyalty ends up transferring over to the uh, the advertiser. But, but to me, it seems like, um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because you, you're the expert here, but that the loyalty would, would be all one-sided because all these people, they know everything about you, but you don't know hardly anything about the, the listeners on the other side. It's 100, it's 100% one-sided. Okay. So you're so, walking down the street and some guy comes up to you and says, hey, I love you, you're my brother, and how do you react to that? Well, I'll, I'll give you the perfect uh, series of examples. I get asked to go to weddings, baptisms, funerals, uh, settings where I might be the only other guy outside of a best man and a bridesmaid, where I might be the only other guy around the baby outside of the godfather and the godmother. Wow. And I have never met nor heard of these people in my life. And what I have to do at that point is explain that to them. 
that this relationship has been entirely one-sided. And while to them it seems natural as can be to have me intimately join their family circle, to me it's as foreign as can be. Yeah. And that, and when they realize that, and they eventually do, they say, "Oh, this this is a little odd, isn't it?" How, how do people? How do they react to that? So, like, someone guy invites you to to the birth of his child, and you're like, "Whoa, this is uh, not natural here." And you explain it like you just did. How, what's his reaction? Their understanding, and 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 not only are they, are they understanding, I also go on to explain that if I literally went to every one of these, um, well, let's put it this way: what I say to him is. If I go to one, I should go to all, because why should I pick and choose? If I don't know you at all, and I don't know this person at all, nor this third person at all, why should I go to one of them, if not all of them? And I can't possibly go to all of them, so I don't go to any of them. And that's sort of how I, I get out of it. Yeah, I, I guess, like, kind of, I don't know, Maddie, Elwood, Dave, this is what I'm hearing. Like, to, to really make it good, what, what makes him successful in this is that he puts 100% and you know, Tom, you put 100% of your soul into it, and you believe it yourself. So these things that you're releasing to the public, this person you're on the radio, is 100% of, uh, of who you are. You're, you are that person for that, for that radio show. And to that, Chris, add in, um, preparation, scripting, yeah. and um, reliance on, on a character which you already know can familiarize yourself with. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the perfect yeah. recipe for pretexting yeah. right there. And yeah. you're obviously successful at it because uh, it's been years, right? How many, how many, you know, how many, how many years yeah. exactly you're running a radio show now? Eighteen. 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 So you probably have um, you probably have fans that have been born and grown up listening to you. <laughs> you know, you have k- kids that were in families that you know now are 18 years old that have probably been listening to you for that long. I yeah, I've had guys who have called me up or have written me and said. Almost, uh, almost that I raised them. You know that they <laughs> they escaped from their parents when they were kids up into their bedroom and listened under the blanket to the radio and you know almost surrogate father kind of stuff. But that, whereas that used to sound really strange in the beginning and, and almost overwhelming, I came to see it as just the story of radio. And if you talk to people who grew up with radio, they'll talk similarly about other talk hosts and other people. It's just it's radio is considered the most intimate medium and 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 what you get from that is exactly what you would expect from that level of intimacy so so besides um besides preparation you know and some of the things that that we talked about is there any other any other secret that you have to i mean because I, I know one of the things that we were listening to some of your clips and some of the stories that that Jim tells us uh, sometimes the people that call in, they just sound so impromptu. I mean, I listened to this one, this kid that called in. You were doing this kid about a, a campground terrorist. I yeah, we're in, that, we're in that same thing. I hear his static. So I'm going to try it. Now you're, now you're back again. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, I'll try doing the uh, call again and see what I okay. see if I, I fix it. I'm going to try that right now. Sure. Okay. We were talking. Uh, Manny, I think one of the things that we should start with when he comes back it's maybe talking about the, um, you know, what other things do you do to not sound like a twat when you're in front of public? I think he pretty much answered that just by being himself and giving 100%. I mean, I was thinking of that question, and I, was, I thought it would be twatty to ask that because he just gave you an answer that blew, you, you know, blew, blew that question out of the water. He just, he just, you know, immerses himself in it, and he gives, him, gives 100% of himself, and that's pretty much what he needs to do in order not to sound like a twat. To me, that was a phenomenal... Yeah, I really like this uh, thingy. It's, I, I really, really like this um, interview. He's a very, yeah, very done really well. I, another slam dunk, dude. Seriously. I, I think uh, another thing that we got to make sure to hit on too is the uh, how he does his advertisements and and that sort of thing. Because his advertisements have always been unique. When he used to play uh, <laughs> hand advertisements. Now, uh, Jim, you're the one who has experience yeah. in that. So when he when he comes yeah. back. You know? Yeah, do, yeah, no, I, I, I got no problem bringing it up. I, I just don't want to talk over anybody. You know, just listening, it sounds like the majority of the time that he, it's so impromptu to hear that all this stuff is scripted. It's just, it's mind blowing. Like especially that that little piece about Conan O'Brien or Dave Letterman. Yeah, that blew, that that blew me away. You know, it, it just, you know, you know what though really blows me away. 
I can understand Conan O'Brien or, or, or the Letterman guy, yeah, because they're, they're professionals. But right. how do the people that, that they're interviewing, how do they not look like it's like, oh, my God, come on, fourth time, really? Right. You know, how do they make it look like it's, it's really happening for the first time? I mean, if it's an mm. actor, you can say, okay, yeah, I get it. But if it's but not, it's not an actor. Always. It's not always an actor. Right. Sometimes it's people who, you know, who, who aren't coming from that field. How do they make it seem like this is really the first time? Oh, yeah, that's so funny. And, and they laugh and make it, you know. <laughs> Forget the professionals. How do the amateurs do it? Yeah. Well, at the same time, I, I, I've got um, something we recorded for the local news here, and you know, every, every time we do something with them, I'm always astounded with how they they say, "I'm going to ask you this." Uh, I'd appreciate an answer along these lines, you know, and then you have to then then they record that, and you have to make that sound authentic and like it was your idea to say that, and and you know, if, if they're telling you something that you don't want to say, find a way around that. Yeah, it's it's. It's media's weird. Hey Tom. Uh, yeah, I hear ya. you. You sound better this time. You sound the same, but I uh. hear you. It's got that. Uh, I can tell there's something funky with this thing because even the woman the recorded message, she's kind of in and out. But let's let's try going again. If it should happen again, uh, I'm gonna. I, what happened was when I was talking to you, I had deleted the email with the number on it thinking well, I won't need this again so I had to go dig it out of the email trash to, and then I was having trouble I, this is the third time I've called because it wasn't connecting me with you but if it happens again I do have the number up on the screen now to call back and I will switch phones I have another landline here and I'll try that okay we were just uh, yeah we were just kind of talking uh, as you were you know you logged off we were just talking about how much how effective this information that you've been giving us is. Um, we had a couple, couple other things. I mean, I think Jim, you had some thoughts that were pretty good. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you have, uh, you've been at this for 18 years now, and uh, I listen to your show now, and you know, most most of what's what's on there sounds very spontaneous. You know, you read a news article, it sounds like it's the first time you you read the article sometimes, and you know, you, you 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 respond to it, and it sounds very impromptu. And, and I'm wondering what over those 18 years from when you were doing just uh, calling into a radio show, you know, once a day to now doing five shows a week. Uh, has anything changed with how you prepare? How, do you approach this any differently? Maybe? Yeah, I'd say the number one thing that's changed from the early years is before I used to be a pre preparation fanatic, and and what would happen in the early days was I just didn't want to leave anything to spontaneity. I just I wanted every because I just had this terror of uh, operating without a net. When you're doing a live radio show, there's just no ability to edit it. And no ability to, you know, to redo it. So I, I would just prepare and prepare and prepare for every single possible uh, thing, so that I wouldn't be um, throwing any curveballs. What happened after a while is I realized that that ultimately didn't serve me well. In that um, you need to keep a part of yourself open to the moment, open to the possibility of a new tangent forming right there on the spot that would not have been thought about at 3 that afternoon and be willing to have the faith to follow it and know that it's going to lead somewhere good and not be so married to the page that you you lose some of the some of the good things that come from being in the moment. So the biggest difference is I don't prepare as much. I count on my own ability to come up with things on the spot now, now more than I used to, and I come and I count on my own ability to have a show go in a different direction than I would have planned, based on a thought, an idea, a call, something new happening in that moment that is more entertaining, interesting, enlightening, intriguing than what I prepared earlier in the day. I didn't used to have faith in that, and I. I think that just comes from experience where after a while you just believe that you have something internally that allows you to depart from the page and depart from the preparation and allow something to happen that's being born right there in the moment. So that's what happens a lot more now. The other, the other thing that I thought was, was really interesting as far as 
you know, when when I was hearing you on on the radio before, you would do advertisements for different things, and now now you you have your sponsors for your podcast, and you have a very unique way that you approach those uh, those bits. You know, with it, I, I remember uh, I used to enjoy your commercial breaks on on the radio because so often you would you'd pipe in, uh, you know. Talking, interacting with the with the commercial in some way, talking about it, and sometimes mocking it. Uh, I, I enjoyed that a, a lot, and and now the way you have you approach your sponsors, it, it's 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 less like an advertisement in a, in a lot of ways. I was wondering if, if, if how you came up with the, your your approach to dealing with advertising. My approach to advertising, uh, the difference. Uh, at KSTP, they definitely said, Mishki, you're going away for a uh, commercial break now. The show is being left behind, and you are now entering a portion of the program called commercials. And there will be several of them. And they will run one after another, and one of them you will do yourself. And uh, I accepted that, and I worked the best I could with it trying to create something interesting in the midst of a commercial break. Um, the, the difference now is the show never leaves. I never go away. Uh, in, one, in, in, in one big respect, that works in the advertiser's favor. Because I don't go away, there's no sense, sense that we're going away for commercial. We're not going anywhere. I'm still here. I haven't left. I'm not going to leave. There is just going to be a different form of dialogue right now that's going to sound very different from uh, what I was just doing before because I'm going to be talking about a business that I want you to um, either – use their service or their product. Um, that sounds very different on a podcast because people said, wait, we didn't go anywhere. We're still in the show. Uh, yes, and the advertiser wins because it ends up sound, sounding like it's not a paid endorsement, but in fact something I just thought of at the moment that I wanted to say to encourage people to uh, use this product or service. In radio, it's much more of a, of a wall between the show and the ads. Um, that's the biggest difference. I also, because there were other ads and there aren't now, was able to make fun of other ads. I was able to have fun with the ads that weren't mine, that other people were doing. <laughs> and now they're, they're, I do every ad, so I, I'd end up having to make fun of my own ads. <laughs> there, there just isn't that break anymore. You know, one of the things we were talking about um, during a, a little intermission there was the topic you brought up with the with like the TV shows that that – Look spontaneous, like especially we were all kind of shocked about the news on the, the Letterman thing. Because sometimes it does. It looks like he just goes out in the audience and you know, he asks someone where they're from and what they're doing there, and the, the answers can't possibly be scripted. Uh, so, uh, do you do you do is that the same thing that radio does? Like, do you do you have to do that when you have an interview? Are these things prepared ahead of time, but then with enough leeway that there could be spontaneous generation there? Well, I don't do I don't do any preparation for my calls. I was using television as an as an extreme example. It's a real example. I have never in my life prepared for a call. You know, I don't I don't sit at home and say what are the different kinds of calls I could get and what will I need to do. That's what uh, you know. Here's the extraordinary thing about something like like Letterman. You have you have 15, 16, 17 different writers. You have guests. You have commercials. You have all sorts of other players, and you still have guys who are working 13 to 16 hours a day. Uh, Jay Leno has never uh, had a family. David Letterman, only within the last uh, few years, uh, finally had a kid. They were incapable of having families and doing what they do. There isn't time. They were just pouring themselves into it. Uh, and, and so that's a real extreme, but that's the extreme you have to work at to be at that level of entertainment. The pressures there are so far beyond uh, what I deal with. So, no, I don't sit there and work on what the calls will be. The calls are spontaneous. In terms of the, the preparation and the bits that I do where I'll leave the page, the best way to describe that is, is as follows. I've, I, I consider the, um, the preparation the net you're building under the high wire. If you want to go off on your own with something you're thinking about right at the moment, a tangent you, you think is interesting to go off on, you, you start going down the tightrope with the advantage that below you is the net of your preparation to catch you if you hit a dead end. 
uh, it's a very comfortable way to be spontaneous because you are freed from worrying that if this doesn't work, I have nothing. Mm. Uh, it's 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 the perfect way to operate because you use then the spontaneity and the and the free form style to go out on that tightrope. But if on that particular night you're not as good as you thought you were and you fall and you go flailing down towards the ground, you're not going to crash and burn because what you have to rely on is that prepared material that you just as seamlessly as possible dovetail right into and no one uh, hardly notices the difference is the switch. So then like that, that brings up a really interesting question for me then because now knowing uh, that, of course, a lot of things are spontaneous for you, uh, somebody calls in. How do you just off the fly be able to come up with things that are entertaining, humorous, um, informational, especially when you have no clue on the other end what what the person is going to say or how they're gonna how they're going to be? Chris has rephrased my question of how do you how do you not sound like a twat on the radio? <laughs> how do I? What was the last part? How do you not sound like 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 an idiot on the radio? What what is it that you do? How do you manage to? Um, to get the That's, spontaneity and remain entertaining. Yeah, that is. I mean, now you're getting into. The, I mean, that is that is that is just the gift. That is the yeah. the thing that I have that allows. That's what I was expecting to hear. You know, we all have talents that allow us to do one thing versus something else. You know, I wouldn't be a very good brain surgeon. But what was very clear early on for me was that. Uh, off the cuff, I happened to be pretty good in life. Uh, I was always able to uh, talk myself growing up out of any fight or any conflict I ever got into. I'm very good at dealing with people. I'm very good at reading people. I'm very good at convincing people of my own sincerity. And I'm, I'm You're a good the, social engineer, in fact. The, the, all, all, the, all the elements that you've just described are, for me, what, what makes a good social engineer a social engineer. I know. I'm thinking, like, does he need a job? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we have some companies we need you to hack. For. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's yeah. What you're talking about now is just the, the the natural talent that that allows me to gravitate or helps me gravitate toward this field to begin with. Those are the skills I bring to the table that that need to be met by other skills that involve more work. But um, that ability to to do the conversation uh, well. That I had before I ever got into radio. Yeah, yeah you that, know, that, that, I, that I would have been able to pull off. I would have pull, been able to pull off those calls ten years before I got into radio, and in fact, you know, was pulling stuff like that off. I was, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a good bullshitter and a very good um, at convincing people that I'm empathizing, listening, and uh, on their side. Yeah, that's. It was an interesting conversation the other day in our in our channel on our uh, on our on the internet. We have a chat channel where people come and talk about social engineering, and somebody brought up this this topic. You know how training and and reading all about different aspects of social engineering can it help someone enhance their skills, but it's not going to give them what you're talking about here. This natural ability that some people just have to be able to talk to strangers or not be nervous in front of a crowd or or not be uh not freak out when when they're presented with a situation that's not exactly the way they have it scripted in their life. And uh yeah. I, wish, I wish there was something we can identify to say that that's what it is, you know, this this is the quality or this is the 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 thing behind it, but I think you hit the nail on the head. It's just that some people just have it. And I I like the people that I'm talking to. So when I'm there, there is there, the reason that they're picking up a genuineness is there's always an element to that. There always is an element of a genuineness. There is a part of me. If you think of a personality as having you know a, a dozen different facets, there are there are a couple facets that are actually empathizing, actually connecting to those people in a way that you would connect to a good friend. There, there, part of it is is real and it's partnered with the phony but it's not completely phony if it were completely 100 percent phony in every way you could never pull it off yeah yeah i agree with that i agree with that so there has to that really does come back to our original discussion uh with you about how a lot of the aspects that you choose to develop as part of this persona or this personality or this pretext 
have to be things that you either are very familiar with, you've lived before, or that you have experience, and otherwise they will come off fake. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to people where, you know, they should be incensed at the 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 the, the way I've duped them. They should be hanging up on me. They should be uh, cursing me. And instead, at the end of the call, we're we're best buddies. You know, why is that? Because um, part of me really does like them, and part of them really does like me, and it doesn't matter that what I just did made them look like an idiot. Uh, Some parts of us are actually connecting, and uh, that's, I guess, the part that amazes most people is that I don't get... I don't get beat up more often. (laughs) Never had somebody walking down the street and be like, there's Tom Mischke, kill him. (laughs) No, although there was one guy in North Dakota, it was a great story, his last name was Mischke, and one day someone came into his uh, gas station, said, where's Mischke? And the guy pointed to him, and he went up to him, and he he cold cocked him. And um, when the story was in the paper, they sent the... uh, copy to me because I was on at night and the show used to you know travel all over the place I used to um, be able to because of night radio get to Kansas and get down to New Mexico and get out to Colorado and and so they sent it to me and the guy's quote was I have no idea who Mishki is but some guy came into the station and said where's Mishki it does happen to be my last name but I've never seen this guy in the world a- anywhere and he clearly is mistaking me for another Mishki. Well, I called the gas station. I said, I'm the guy that that guy mistook you for. I'm sure of it. Uh, and the reason I was sure of it is one of the states I used to beat up on more than anything else was North Dakota. Oh. And I learned from talking to this guy that, in fact, the guy had been upset about how this guy was talking about the state of North Dakota. Oh, I wasn't talking about it that way. He just had a gas station. So I don't know how he got to this gas station, but that guy took my punch. Oh, man. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) That is more material to make fun of North Dakota, huh? Yeah. I guess guess that that probably gave you some, uh, some ammo for North Dakota bashing, huh? Yeah, I mean, I used to just spend a lot of time beating up on North Dakota. If I ever needed a state as a foil, I used North Dakota, the way a lot of people in Minnesota use Wisconsin. I always used North Dakota. So anything bad I always made happen in North Dakota. If there was some inane <laughs> guy out there doing something, I always made sure he was from North Dakota. And uh, this poor guy in Jamestown took one for the team. Oh, man. No no relation, though, huh? No, no Mishki relation. No, well, I, I always conclude, I mean, I always conclude we all have to be related. It's too unusual of a name, but I don't know how. Right. <laughs> That's epic. <laughs> so, Tom, where if people wanted to, to listen to your show now, if they wanted to hear uh, a little bit about you, where, where can they go to hear you? Citypages.com. Uh, and once once they arrive at City Pages, C-I-T-Y, Pages, P-A-G-E-S, once they arrive at citypages.com, it's quite um, self-explanatory at that point. They see my name. You click on the name. It goes to my page. There's past radio shows and uh, the current show and all that. So it's it's just all they need to know is that, citypages.com. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so we'll be checking that out. We'll be linking to that too. Um, so people. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be... Uh, experienced live. Uh, the majority of the people who listen to my show now do not listen live. It's available afterwards for over a week. So people just listen, you know, 24 hours a day whenever they feel like downloading it or listening to it or whether they put it on their iPod and take a walk with their dog. So that's the new medium, the old days of radio where if you had to, wanted to listen, you had to set your watch. Those days are over. How has that transition been for you as far as adapting? Yep, so the, the the upside of it is absolute and complete freedom. So, the, I mean, there's uh, – people used to tell me at KSTP, boy, you've got a lot of freedom here. Any other station you go to, you'll be curtailed. They'll never let you get away with the stuff you get away with here. Uh, there's something unique about this uh, company and allowing you to do this. These were people who had worked at other stations around the country. So I was already warned that none of what I do would be allowed elsewhere. Uh which really made it tough when I lost my job at KSTP because I thought, well, now I enter the real world. I'm going to go somewhere where you get a memo in your box every day and you get sound 
sound check sessions every afternoon where you go over what you said on the air, which is the norm. The norm in radio is going over what you said the night before. This didn't work. This did work. Don't do this again. This would be better if you did it this way. That would kill me. It would absolutely destroy me. So I get to city pages with this, and it goes the other way. It actually, the last little bits of control and the last little bits that weren't free at KSDP went away, and now I have complete freedom. I have no FCC, no regulations on what I do at all. The people I work for offer no insight, no ideas, no thoughts, no corrections. No, they, don't, they don't care what I do almost uh, I bring in the advertising myself, so as long as I cover my bases there, they say do whatever you want. That level of freedom which webcasting provides is a spoiling kind of a thing, and I would really have a hard time going back to being um, in the in the straitjacket that would be typical commercial radio. Now, it's it's unfortunate because you always want to be ready to go back to commercial radio. You may have to at some point, and so you don't want to get too spoiled and lose your ability to work in those confines, but boy, I can just give you an example. I just finished a show 20 minutes before I called you that uh, that I did with, you know, a cigar in my hand and two beers that went down during it. You know, good luck not getting fired with that at any other station in town. I can pick up the phone now and call anybody anywhere without calling them ahead of time to tell them I'm going to be calling them. That's what I got fired for at KSTP. That's illegal. That's an FCC violation. You cannot make a phone call from a radio station and put on someone's voicemail without being fined, right. let alone talking to a real human being. Then there are all the words you can't say, and then there are all the you know, the management guys who come in and say, well, you went a little far here. You ticked off an advertiser, which also happened at KSTP. I did an entire bit at KSTP ripping McDonald's because they were starting a new ad campaign where they took the mothers of children into their factory to show them how they come up with their food and how nutritious it was. And they were airing these as commercials. And I was parodying this absurd notion that mothers are going to be convinced they ought to give their kids more McDonald's food by visiting the factories. Well, little did I know that McDonald's was negotiating a quarter-million-dollar deal with ASTP at the time. And the franchise owners heard it and went nuts. Uh, if you go downtown... If you go downtown during the twin season, you'll see that outside the stadium, there's the KSTP McDonald's talk box. Oh, my. Uh, they won, I lost. They got the talk box, I got fired. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, I tell you, the, the information, that, uh, this too, but I mean, even before the information we were discussing about uh, your persona and pretexting has been real helpful for our, for our program. It was, it was a privilege to, to, to speak to you for me. Really. Um, well, thank you very, very, very many it. interesting things. That was, that was amazing. I, I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was not coal mining. It was, it was fun. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're still doing what you're doing, and I have enjoyed your show for a long time, and still, still am. And I hope a lot of people uh, keep, keep tuning in and downloading your show. So, it's, it's, it's yeah. It will actually be more interesting listening now, too, you know, going forward, thinking, having this little bit of behind-the-scenes peak. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still learning the ropes on this newer version. I mean, one thing that happens when you're given a lot of freedom is that, that that's just that many more options out there. Uh, constraints and restrictions are often make, make a job really easy because you go, well, they're making it, so I have to do this, this, and this. When you don't have those restraints, you all of a sudden have to say to yourself, are you doing all you could be doing with this medium, given all the freedom you have? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's taking me a while, I'm only seven months in, to figure out what all can this thing be, what all can I do with it? Uh, but I told somebody one time within the last week, I said, you know, in 1923 or 24, whenever radio came along, it was a guy, a human being with a mouth and a brain in front of a microphone. It's 2009. I'm a human being with a brain and a mouth in front of a microphone. There's an aspect of this thing that has never changed decade in and decade out. It is still an ear somewhere out there listening to a human voice uh, through some speaker. In in a lot of ways, radio is is the same as this and the same as what it was in 23 and 53 and 73. It's still that idea of connecting with another human being uh, in a way that is appealing enough to make that human being want to do it again the next day. That also I never want to lose sight of. Technology is not changing the basic concept of what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that is an interesting topic and how it ties in, too, with even what we do because 
I think he just described what a hacker is. <laughs> yeah, because I need technology. How do you work with a medium that you that you need to ignore its its uh, its guidelines and its um, you know what I mean? Yeah. No. I, exactly. Because technology. Actually, you guys. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You guys have got me thinking, and I mean, I've never, <laughs> I've never connected any of my skills, talents, interests, or my job with what, what you guys are connecting it with, and it's it's really sent my head spinning a little bit from the very first time you introduced the topic because I never thought about it that way. But I, I now realize what a wonderful criminal I would have been. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, All those know, wasted years, my friend. <laughs> you know what's interesting is when we started talking about this this topic of what we can do for a podcast, uh, Jim is the one who said, you know, what about a radio personality? And my first reaction was, similar to what you just said, what the heck does a radio personality know about social engineering? And then he did this long, like, kind of sales pitch and sold me on it. I think he had you in mind the whole time because it was like a breath later he says, and I have this guy I'm thinking about, Tom Mischke. (laughs) So basically, basically, Elwood social engineered. Oh, big time. And not only did he do it, but it was a, it was an epic win on his point. Wow! I just because wanted a chance to talk to him. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so you used no, it as your own to... personal fan uh, fan following thing you know, with? Uh, nice. It's all about me. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that all the time when I want to interview somebody for the show. I I, I I couch it in wanting to talk to them about their new book or something. But the truth <laughs> is, I'm probably just a fan of theirs who's always wanted to get them on the phone, and it's the only way I can do it. Now you can thank Jim for that because I bet, okay. but it. I tell you, it fit. It fit perfect because it um, not really thinking about how you would have to do that. When we had our first phone conversation, uh, Tom, I was it really hit us afterwards. We got very excited about about talking to you um, because you really have to do all. You have to use social engineering without even knowing what you're using. All these different aspects of it to do your job on a daily basis. And, uh, right, right. Yeah, that's what I've learned from talking to you guys. Is just how much of that it does connect. Uh, that I would have. I think so much of of what I do because it it came from talents that I already had that you didn't necessarily go to school for. I didn't have names for it, and I didn't uh, think of it. You know, there's so much of what I do that there isn't a school for. You know, I I didn't go to broadcasting school. Maybe they do teach some of this stuff. I don't know. But I think it's because I didn't have a book or anything to follow or, or, oh, what you're doing right there, Mishki, is called A or B or C. Oh, that little... Thing you, that little trick you're playing with that guy on the phone there is a real common trick, and it's called C. You know, no one ever told me that stuff. I was just uh, doing what I do, and uh, as I've talked to you guys, I've realized that you know there are actual skills that could be given names that can be used for the dark side yeah. or the or the light side. Definitely, well, I'll tell you. Um, if I don't know if you've had a chance to check it out, but you're you're definitely welcome. You know, door will always be open to you. you come come to the site if you feel like. You know, anytime you see something on there that you want to want to alter or contribute to or, or read on, you know, it's our site's there as a resource for everybody. So, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we can we'll, we'll be listening to Tom's show down the road and hear him most definitely. Yeah, <laughs> referring to elicitation yeah. and pretexting and <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and and feel free to uh, feel free to give a call back if there's ever a need for clarification on anything that we've talked about. But uh, uh, as I said earlier, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, we, we did too. Really, we, we all so learned. That's great. And um, I'd, I'd like to also extend the same uh, the same courtesy. If you ever need anything, please feel free to call us. We'll I will do so. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll hang on to my uh, my emails here. Yeah, yeah don't don't just put that that mail in the trash just yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't don't throw it Don't do yet. what? <laughs> don't put that mail in the trash just yet. No, no, I was a little, a, a little, a little quick on the trigger there. Uh, <laughs> hang on to it. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. Today. Okay, guys, you take care of yourselves. Bye bye. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Wow, what an excellent interview, huh? Yes. Was what guy. an interesting person. Really. Yep. Uh, his stories, uh, a lot of the the things that he mentioned, I thought were really uh, Elwood. Good job because I tell you I really wasn't I wasn't sold on it until before when we talked to him that first time but it came uh, the information he has was even better than what I had imagined. Well, I think too you know especially for our listeners you know you listen to us and you listen to us uh, interview him 
listen to a show and you hear a lot of these techniques being demonstrated. And you can always learn from other people. You can, and it's, it's convenient, you know? Like it's a podcast just like this. Download it, listen to it, and see what you can pick up. Yeah, really excellent stuff. I'd like to thank again Tom Mishke for uh, joining us today. You can feel free to check him out on citypages.com, and we'll have a link for that in our podcast page. Uh, another thanks to our sponsor for, for this episode, uh, Spy Associates. Uh, you can feel free to check them out on spyassociates.com. We look forward to uh, having you again next month. We'll keep you in touch with what's coming up. Thanks for um, Jim, and Maddie, and Dave for joining us today. Had a great time. And if you uh, have some interest in the music that's playing on the outro here. Yes, Chris, 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 Chris. Yes, yes. That. that music is awesome. You know, like that? I love it. <laughs> you know, we had a lot of people. Actually, I, had, I, had a, I should say this first. We had a couple people write in and be like, what the heck? What kind of music is that? You know, all, most podcasts are playing like heavy metal or something. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, we're different. We're different. We're not. We're not the average podcast. And then I, had, I love it. It's so laid back. So nice. I had so many people right in, but like, man, I relaxing. listen to this. You know, can you play the whole song? And I'm like, you know, maybe. So this time I might actually put more of the song on the outro. So if you're interested. <laughs> Good idea. Thank you. I, I definitely will. I'm uh, like Michael recording Anthony. the whole podcast to the end just to listen to the music. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> So coming up, coming up next episode, we also also mentioned is how to get free chicks. So. Yeah, um, that's all for today, <laughs> ladies and gents. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> uh, the music I just got to mention this ccmixer.org. You can check them out, Michael Anthony, on that if you're curious about uh, getting more music from him. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. We had a good right, time. Okay, take care. Yep. Um, don't all right, thank you. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter, Human Hacker. You can check us out on IRC on freenode.net at this channel, Social Engineer. And don't forget our website, social-engineer.org. Twitter for our newsletter. Keep in touch with us with our podcast. We'll talk to you next time. Watch your back, walk on, walk on, on the old track, walk on, walk on, watch your back, oh, walk on, Ooh, walk on, hey, walk on, yeah. hey, walk on, 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 Talking about every single day. Two step forwards and no one step back. Walk on. Trying to remain on track. Yeah. Stay on track. Watch your back. 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 Walk on. Walk on. Walk on. Walk on. You walk. Cut to the line. Time after time. Now the game isn't played that way. You've got to stay on track. Walk on, walk on, watch your back. Walk on, walk on, stay on track. Walk on, walk on, watch your back. Walk on, walk on, looking around you and thinking it's okay. Forgetting about the things that you did yesterday. The game isn't played that way. Stick your track on, walk on, watch your back, walk on, stay on track, walk on, watch your back, walk on, stick your track on, walk on, watch your back, walk on, stay on track.